It is the last day of December, which means it's time for everyone's favourite video. I feel like I can say that everyone loves watching these videos, I feel like, so this is my favourite books 2023, yay, I'm so excited, I'm looking at them now and I feel very warm in my heart looking at them. I had an alright reading year, this is the fourth year that I've been tracking my um, books on, or my reading on Goodreads, and this is the first year that I am not meeting my reading goal, which is upsetting, but I know that it shouldn't matter that much. It doesn't matter to me that much, but it is a bit disheartening. I feel like everyone loves when you reach a goal and it, the little the confetti comes up on Goodreads. Not gonna be me this year, but that's fine. I set my reading goal for 70 books, which I knew was gonna be kind of ambitious, but I read, I read 67 last year, so I thought it was gonna be realistic, and I always wanted to just read more than I did last year. But this year I ended up reading 62, which I'm still very, very, very happy with. And I feel very grateful that I've had enough time to be able to read all of these books and there were so many good ones and we're gonna talk about them now. So these are in chronological order uh, of how I read them because I didn't really have a favorite book this year that was maybe the standout, I wanna say. I did have one last year, which was The Idiot and I feel like that's gonna be, it's just my favorite book in general, which amazing segue. <laughs> I read Either Or by Ailey Fatterman, which is the sequel to The Idiot. I read it this year earlier in the year, it actually came out last year, but I hyped this up in my head so much and I had such high expectations that I was almost a little bit apprehensive to read this, but I was not disappointed at all. Similarly to The Idiot, nothing much happens, but also everything happens. We pick up where we left off with the idiot, but in either or, Selin goes to travel and she leaves Harvard again. And while she does that, she discovers boys, she discovers alcohol. This is more of a, not coming of age story, but it is kind of going in that direction a little bit while we still follow her in a monologue, which that's my favorite thing about these books. I love Selin as a character so much. Honestly, when, I finished both of the books, I just felt so, I felt like I was leaving a friend behind that still think about Selin from time to time. I just understand her on an emotional level, I feel like. Um, what makes these novels so worth reading for me is the writing. I really, really, really enjoy Elif Batman's writing because to me anyway, I feel like it's very straightforward and I really like that. I am not a fan of flowery writing or I don't know I feel like my pretentiousness threshold is quite low so <laughs> I really really appreciate this um I find Selin endlessly interesting I would read anything revolving around Selin um I know that Elif Batamad said that there's not going to be another book in this series which I just don't want to think about so I'm just gonna live here forever in my head and just be happy it happened. <laughs> After that, I read One's Company by Ashley Hudson, her name is. This is one that I've not heard many people or anyone really talk about, but this was a banger for me. I really enjoyed this. It's a debut novel. The main character of One's Company is Bonnie, who is a woman who is very much an introvert she likes to be left to her own devices she likes to be alone and follow her own routines um part of her routine is watching her favorite tv show three's company and she watches it on a loop she watches it all the time it's very very comforting to her it's very much part of her life and she then ends up winning the lottery and she's not really sure what to do with the money then she decides to move to the mountains and recreate the set of her favorite tv show three's company down to the t like she recreates it in such detail she hires a company and she does loads and loads of research to perfectly recreate it and her goal is to live there by herself and 
not recreate the episodes but she lives as each character for i'm not sure how long like months on end we do find out the background and the reason why she has that wish to be so separate from society and reality and a lot of things happen i don't want to say too much but i really really enjoyed this this was so fun to read while still having a lot of substance um i really enjoyed this and i think more people should read this next up we've got writers and lovers by lily king i picked this up a while ago a couple of years ago but i never actually finished it i knew that i was going to love this book when i started it and i also knew that it wasn't i wasn't in the right mindset for the book at the time and i was right because when i picked it up again this year i was into it immediately and i felt so connected to our main character casey i love this book so much this is like it breaks your heart but it puts it together again for you as well so we follow casey who is a 30 something i think she's 31 which is actually something that i really enjoy because i feel like a lot of these slice of life books are about 20 something year olds and i really enjoyed that she was a little bit older a little bit more mature she had a bit more life experience um so casey has recently lost her mother and she's also if i remember correctly broken up with a long-term boyfriend so she is struggling she feels like she is stuck in her life and what she really wants to be is a writer and i feel like we throughout the story we find out that she's actually really talented at writing and she's just sort of waiting to be discovered she is moving to boston after losing her mother and her boyfriend and she is waitressing at this sort of upper class uh, restaurant and we follow her everyday life while she meets two very different men that she falls in love with both of them and that is a big part of the story but it's not about that it's not about the men it's not about the romance i don't think anyway it's about casey it's really casey's story it's about her following her dreams and trying to deal with the grief of her mother who she's had a really close relationship with if i remember correctly it's been a while since i read this i also really enjoyed that throughout this book you are rooting for both of the men that she is kind of dating that she is getting to know they're both very very different but they've both got something they've both got redeeming qualities i would have been happy for her to end up with either of them but i don't even remember who she did end up with that's how much it was not about the men in her life it was truly a casey story this is also set in the late 90s i think it's 1997 which the vibe was just there i feel like this story works so much better than it would have if it was set in present day even just the lack of social media this was very it felt nostalgic it felt very warm and cozy even though there were a lot of heavy themes obviously with the grief of her mother um it was so introspective it was so relatable i just casey is another character that i've been thinking about and i love her and i don't think that there's ever going to be a sequel of this but I would love to know what she ended up doing with her life and where we where we left her what happened after that but i'm gonna guess that's not gonna happen for me <laughs> after that i read ooh, death valley by melissa broder so i am a big melissa broder fan i really love her i've listened to every of her uh, podcast episodes i I just really like her as a person. I had to change the camera angle. This window was bothering me so much because it kept tinging everything a little bit blue. If that bothered you as well, I'm sorry. Now I'm backlit, which I'm not sure if that's any better, but we move, we're just gonna keep going. So Death Valley, I got this as an art from NetGalley and I read it back in June. I was so excited about it and it did not disappoint. In Death Valley, we follow an unnamed narrator who wants to escape her everyday life. She's got an chronically ill husband she's got a dad who's in the icu who's not well and she ends up in this chain hotel and the receptionist ends up recommending her this hike she then goes on a journey <laughs> i want to say of 
self-reflection, existential crisis, magical realism. I don't want to say too much, but if you are up for a little bit of weird, it's not super weird. If you're up for that, I think that this is a great book. After that, I read, oh, I love this, Romantic Comedy by Curtis Sittenfield. This is one romance book I can get behind. So I am not a romance reader. I wish I was because it looks very, very fun. I see all of the people on TikTok reading their um, romance books and having such a fun time with it. I tried, but it's just not me. <laughs> this one though is so much in the direction of literary fiction that I could still really enjoy it. Obviously it being written by Curtis Sittenfield has a lot to do with that. So romantic comedy is about Sally and Noah. Sally is a writer on the night owls, which is essentially Saturday Night Live, and she's been there for a long time. And one week she meets the musical host, no, the musical guest and the host, he does both, Noah, who is a singer-songwriter, and they end up having a great connection. My battery is dead. <laughs> One second, we're back. <laughs> anyway, what I was saying is I love their connection. I thought that their dialogue was so believable. Them getting to know each other was so believable. So much research has got into this. I could just really appreciate this book. Um, yeah, really enjoyed it. After that, I read Penance by Eliza Clark. So this is an interesting concept because we're reading a fictional book about an also fictional true crime case. The case covers a murder by a 16 year old girl by her school friends. Eliza Clark is so talented <laughs> in general. I've not read boy parts yet, but it's on my shelves. But she's so smart, big brained for this book. This is obviously a fictional case, but she made reading it seem like an actual true crime book and so you could just go and google and look up the details of this case there are interviews there are tumblr posts there are correspondence uh, with one of the girls in prison there are articles it's just so detailed and she just captures how truly horrible teenagers can be i really enjoyed the ending i know that some people didn't but I thought everything came together and so much, or so many of the choices that she made made so much sense. Uh, this is a great book and I would go into it knowing little as possible. Basically, I just would let the experience happen, let the book consume you and just be along for the ride. I feel like you're not gonna regret that. After that, I read My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. I've got it here, actually. My friend Anna gave me a copy because she hated this book. <laughs> I heard so many people talk about this. Um, I was never intrigued because of this horrible cover. Why would you make this choice? I don't know. But because I've heard so many people whose opinion I trust talk about this and who have got similar reading taste to me, I was then interested to pick up. So My Brilliant Friend is part one or the first book in the Neapolitan Quartet series. And it's about two friends, they're very unlikely friends, Elena and Leela, and it's set in Naples in the 1950s. All of this I read and I was like, not for me. I'm not a historical fiction girly, not interested, but this is so much more than that. I. So we follow them throughout, I think the first book is set over about 10-ish years. So we follow them from being schoolgirls to 10 years after that. And I love that because we spend so much time with them, you get so many details of their friendship and you get so many, you get so much gossip of the town that they live in. They live in this small Italian town. Everyone knows each other. Everyone's got like their own law. You get so much backstory, you get so much gossip. I ended up being so interested in the gossip about these fictional people and I was, I needed to know what would happen. If you are also a person that is interested in friendship stories, in family sagas, in just very detailed human relationship stories, pick up, honestly, it's so worth it. I love the writing. I was so engrossed in it. Um, it was just so fun and so, not even plotty, but you were invested. You wanted to know what was gonna happen and I ended up 
really liking both the characters even though they're very they're not the most likable people both of them they've definitely got their flaws and that was something that even drew me to the story even more because i just loved how real these people seemed okay we've only got three more to go the next one is the friend by secret nunez this was probably the most surprising favorite this year this was just not on my radar um but i'm so happy i read this this is a story about an author who loses a lifelong friend and she is left with his dog to look after him and he is a great dane so huge dog my legs really falling asleep oh. obviously this book talks a lot about grief but with her being an author it also talks a lot about writing which is what kept me really interested i really liked her musings on writing on being an author on her best friend was also an author so just the literary world it's definitely also a book where nothing much happens but those seem to be my favorite ones those slice of life stories but they only work for me if i can relate to the character or if i'm interested in the character which i definitely was with this one i really appreciated her in a monologue and her trying to deal with this situation that's just been thrust upon her and having to just deal with it i also really really like the ending on this one it's a very short book it's also very cozy um if you like books about writing if you like reflective and introspective stories this could be one for you i think it's still very it's an accessible book i want to say after that <laughs> the shards by brett easton ellis this is the only man on this list and i was annoyed that wasn't going to be all women but i couldn't i would have lied to myself if i wouldn't have put this on my list i really enjoyed this book a lot it's a bit of a random one for me but i saw that Jalen from the barn the bookcase i think this was like his favorite book of the year and i picked it up because firstly i enjoy a lot of the books that he talks about and the books that i've not read that he talks about i trust his opinion so much because we are we do have a similar ish reading taste that i thought even though this is a 600 page book written by a man i'm still gonna pick this up not me talking about him like i know him i've literally never talked to him but i enjoy his booktube channel very very much <laughs> the way that the shards is constructed is interesting because it's brett easton ellis who is if you don't know maybe the author of american psycho and multiple other books um also he's written less than zero i can't remember anymore those are the two that he talks about in the shards as well uh it's brett easton ellis writing about a fictionalized version of his teenage years in a way this is almost similar to Pennons, and i feel like there's a theme here i just really like authors playing with form so there'll be times where he's saying things like oh after i finished writing american psycho or he's also talking about the book that he's wanting to write which ends up being less than zero um and yeah he's referencing a lot of his actual work which i love that <laughs> that was so interesting for me very meta so he sort of looks back on his past as a 50 something year old i want to call this a thriller set in the 70s and we follow Brett, a fictionalised Brett, in his senior year at Buckley, where a new student who is called Robert Mallory joins the school and joins his friendship group. And there are also, at the same time, very gruesome murders are happening. I do want to say at this point that the murders in this are intense, specifically the animal deaths and the scenes that, like the murder scenes that he leaves are very theatrical they're just very staged but in a gruesome way if that's not your vibe then maybe this isn't the book for you <laughs> i want to say that so while the book does focus on the murders and the trawler who is the serial killer that's what they name him while we do follow that it is mostly focused on brett and his friendship group and how he feels towards robert mallory and how he just never trusts him but he's very much part of his friendship group i was so into this and i feel like a big part of that was the setting this being set in the 80s in california i feel like i said it was set in the 70s it wasn't it was set in the 80s definitely the the vibes were just there it was 
I was gonna say a lot of research went into this, but obviously Brett Easton Ellis probably actually lived through all of that and it was just his memory. <laughs> that setting through the lens of these privileged prep school kids whose parents are literally friends with Joan Diddy and they just name dropped her and quite a few other people actually. Um, I feel like that's what kept me reading for so long. I'm not a fast reader, but I feel like I flew through this even though it was 600 pages. So many niche things that I really enjoy just kind of came together perfectly in this book for me. The fact that it was queer, the fact that it was set in the 80s in California, which like, it was just this really like glamorous setting. The fact that he's like a, an aspiring author, um, I don't know, just everything, the vibes were just really great and I feel like I'm not selling this well, but this is such a huge book, you don't need me to tell you to read this. And also I'm not going to because Brett Easton Ellis is not someone that, I don't know, I just read, uh, I watched one of his interviews and I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, moving on, this is the last book and this is the most recent book I read, I only finished this about four-ish days ago so it's very fresh in my mind and my love for it is still very much present in my heart and it's Bright Young Women by Jessica Knoll I'm not sure how to pronounce her name if it's a silent K or not we don't know I feel like I need to set a disclaimer for this I know that everyone is over true crime and if you read this you might think this might be just another crime book it's not this while it does cover the most recent not most recent the kind of latter end of Ted Bundy's killing sprees it's not about him at all it's about the surviving women and it's about how Ted Bundy really was just a man and how the women that he or his life he impacted were the extraordinary ones not him <laughs> that's what this is about I feel like I've seen people maybe not pick this up because they thought it might be just another true crime book or another Ted Bundy story. It's not, he's not even mentioned or not even named in this book. It's set in the 70s for the most part anyway. There's two timelines, one present day, one and one in the 70s. And we follow two women, Ruth and Pamela. Ruth ends up being a victim of Ted Bundy in the end actually. This is not a spoiler, it says it on the back. And we follow her up until her disappearance. And the other timeline is Pamela's timeline. And um, Pamela is a survivor of the attack on the sororities where she's actually the president. She is the president of the sorority that Ted Bundy, uh, where he murdered two women. I loved everything about this book. There's nothing that I would have changed. It was a five star read for me. I think what really did it for me was the fact that even though people still to this day romanticize serial killers and romanticize Ted Bundy there's nothing in interesting about him there's nothing what's interesting is the women I feel like this book really highlights that and I appreciate that endlessly because do these men really need any more airtime I don't think they do they already get too much why do they need a Netflix documentary they don't the underlying story of this book is friendship and sisterhood and definitely injustice if you are interested in any of those topics please read this book i feel like you will not regret it it's amazing that was it we made it to the end i feel so filled with love i feel so excited to continue reading my tbr for well potential tbr this mental list in my head <laughs> is full of books I'm so 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 excited about. Um, I am gonna set my reading goal at 52 books instead of 60 plus. One book a week is realistic for me and if I go over that, great. If I don't, also fine. Look, like I have to tell myself this all the time. It's only a number on a screen. <laughs> it's not that deep. Another thing I really want to change in the coming reading year is I wanna read a lot more non-fiction. I feel like that's a classic reading New Year's resolution. People always want to read more non-fiction, which is great, but I do actually want to realise that. And I've got actually a few non-fiction books that are on my January reading list. I felt like sharing it for some reason. So I, two of these actually kind of go together. I actually bought this in my last vlog, which is Abroad in Japan by Chris Broad, I think, yeah. I am traveling to Japan in March and I wanted to read some 
I want to read some Japanese fiction as well, but this is obviously non-fiction. This is about a man who moved to Japan 10 years ago and this is his experience in Japan moving there as a foreigner. I think he's from England, so I am excited about this. And also I want to read The Art of Travel by Alan de Bottom. I know that his name is, I think he's French. French Swiss? I just googled, I don't know where I got that from. He's Swiss born, but a British author. I don't know where I got the French from, maybe his name sounded a bit French to me. But I feel like everyone and their mum talks about him and loves his books. I've got two more on my shelves. I know that <laughs> I know that Harry Styles likes A Course of Love, so I did have to pick that up because of it. I did. Yeah. But this one is a non-fiction about traveling and I bought this in Amsterdam with my friend Josie and I remember that bookstore very fondly. It was a very, very cute bookstore. I did start it already because I've got a, this is actually, this was the bookstore, the book exchange. I love how they crossed out the opening times and just wrote over it. That's really sweet. This is a non-fiction about traveling and I'm sure with it being written by Alan de Botton, I'm sure it's gonna be still somewhat philosophical. I'm actually really excited to read this and this is the prime book. Like the size of this, perfect. The, like the quality, the heaviness of it, the pages are like really thick and heavy, it's just chef's kiss, perfect. And another book, another non-fiction is Monsters by Claire D. Did you, did you read? No idea how to pronounce the last name, I'm sorry. This is called Monsters, A Fan's Dilemma and I don't know a lot about this, but what I do know I'm very intrigued by. I know that this touches on the art versus artist conflict and can you really separate a problematic person's art from them as a person? I guess I'll have to find out. I've got a few people who are problematic faves. Matty Healy, I'm looking at you. Uh, I'm super excited to read this because I am nothing if not a fan. I am a fan of so many things and an intense fan of so many things. I feel like this could be sobering for me to read, so exciting. And there's one more thing that I need to show you just because it's so precious. For my secret Santa for Christmas, I got a, you know those book stamps that you can put in your books, saying like the library of, mm -hmm. I got that and I, I wished for it, but wait, I'm just going to cover up my last name. Isn't that so precious? Look at the little rat, the rat reading. I love it so much. That just makes me so happy. I can't wait to go through all of my books and stamp them all and then lend them out to my friends. That's it. That's my favourite books 2023. I can't wait to see what great books I'm going to read in 2024 and I can't wait to watch everyone else's favourite books in 2023. They're just the best. I love end of year content. It's so fun. Um, anyway, thank you so much for watching if you made it this far. I feel like this might have been a bit of a long video. Sorry. But there was just a lot to talk about and I will see you in my next video. Goodbye.